All right, who gulped? Somebody gulped. Look, we have got a long way to go. We're supposed to sip, not gulp. I didn't go. No? I sipped. Do I believe? Well, now why do you believe her and not me? Because when you lie, it's all over your face. She's a much better liar than you are. Well, thank you. Wait a minute. Look at my go. Boy, I was going to kick your butt for something, but I, I don't remember. Sheridan is not alone. And you are not alone. The League stands with you. We all stand with you. This is the White Star Fleet. Negative on surrender. We will not stand down. Who is this? Identify yourself. Who am I? I am Susan Ivanova. Commander. Daughter of Andre and Sophie Ivanov. I am the right hand of vengeance. And the boot that is going to kick your sorry ass all the way back to Earth. Death incarnate. And the last living thing that you are ever going to see. God sent me. On the next Battle on Five. President Clark knows you're heading to Mars. You're going to lay a trap for this fleet of yours. As the enemy launches an all out offensive to destroy the rebel fleet. Is that what I think it is? Sheridan's only hope for escape is the man who set him up. We can get him out, but we gotta get to him before they ship him our side. First tactical squadron, go! This is the night that will decide the fate of the rebellion on the next Babylon 5. I don't watch TV. It's a cultural wasteland filled with inappropriate metaphors and an unrealistic portrayal of life created by the liberal media elite. You have transmissions holding. Patch incoming signal. Full audio and video decode. Purple files accessed. What you are about to see has never been shown to anyone outside the break house. there in podcast land welcome to gray 17 a babylon 5 podcast part of the front row network and npr illinois community voices we're a group of first ones watching babylon 5 for the umpteenth time and a group of newbies watching babylon 5 for the very first time and we are on episode 19 of season four which is between the darkness and the light and before we get going here for our friends over at facebook i'm gonna take a drink of beer because my voice is crackling thanks facebook okay Let's keep going. I'm Scott, and with me is... Blake. Jesse. Kevin. Justin. Mike. And Nicole. And Emily is stuck in Florida. Thoughts and prayers. Thoughts and prayers. <laughs> she needs them. Before we start talking about this lovely episode where nothing happens, I will first ask that you again check out our social medias. The links are down below. And also, if you're listening to our podcast version of this, we have a YouTube where you can find that link as well. And if you're watching on YouTube, we do have the audio podcast. Check out all those links as well. We are only a few weeks away from our live season four recap show. So be sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel and click that notify bell icon. So when we do go live for that, you'll know about it as soon as it happens. So you can join the conversation that way. Again, also please leave a review wherever you are listening to us. The reviews absolutely do help us grow, especially an Apple review. And we got a new one in This week, this one comes from G. Sonnenberg, and G. Sonnenberg says, fun people to spend time with. Other reviews have described the show, so this one will follow their general format. My first impression was a concern that there were too many people on the pod. Would there be a chance for everyone to speak, or would it be too difficult to manage? But after listening to the team over the season, their personalities emerged. There are shows where some voices were quieter than I preferred, but for the most part, They do a good job letting everyone contribute. The format of veterans and rookies really works, particularly the people who are challenged to enjoy the show, our challenged people, folks. It's like sharing something with friends or family. You'll get different points of view, and if you're open to the experience, you are richer for it. These guys are great, and I predict they'll continue to grow over time. And as a final note, it is nice to revisit a show that no one else in my life watched. 
So thanks, G. Sonnenberg. We appreciate it. And uh, again, you can leave your reviews on Audible, Apple, Spotify, and a few other places as well. By the way, Justin, I did see on Spotify that you said that Justin guy is pretty cool. So good job, Justin. Way to, way a, little, to a little bit of harmless self-promotion never hurt anybody. <laughs> I, I, was, I had a little icon pop up. Oh, we got a Spotify review. I go click on it. That Justin guy is pretty cool. I'm like, oh, that's cool. And I read it. I'm like, from Justin. I'm like, <laughs> nice. <laughs> I couldn't resist myself. <laughs> I, just, I Hey, it counts. <laughs> Analytics, it counts. Okay, so let's go ahead and dive in to this episode. And I believe Nicole has a synopsis for us. Yes, I do. Okay, so this episode is the one where everything happens. Friends reference. Anyways, Garibaldi's captured by the Mars resistance. Ivanova's fleet clashes with Clark's forces. A plan to free Sheridan is launched. A secret vote goes down. There's a huge battle. It is a big one. So if you have thought maybe the season is slow or slowing down, get your shit ready because you're going to get rocked. You're going to get rocked. Much like Ivanova's face. You're going to get rocked. Too soon. Too too soon. soon. (laughs) We'll get there. We'll get there. Oh, yes. Okay. Let's go ahead and get our first impressions from our newbies who, again, have not watched past this episode. And we'll go to Jessie first because she's giving me a really dirty look. Jessie, first impressions. Well, in the famous words of my good friend Will Ferrell in Set Brothers, uh, this wedding is horseshit. This is bullshit. Listen, I haven't threatened to quit in three seasons. And I'm about there. If this bitch dies, we're done. We're done. We're done. I'm done. <laughs> and I said that after the very first pilot season. But I'm done. I'm quitting. It's nice knowing everybody. This is bullshit. What? Continue, oh. please. So oh, please, get you continue your rant. This is horseshit. I literally love this woman and went from couldn't stand her. She was annoying, this, that, and the other. And now she's on the cusp of dying and I'm going to exit stage left. So the rest of the episode, I don't even remember. That's the only part I remember. That's it. That's all I've got. <laughs> I, I am absolutely going to put together a short for YouTube that is you bitching about Takashima leaving and how you fucking hate Ivanova. And I'm just going to transition right over. I'm, I'll do like the do, 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 do. And then you'll pop up and go, this bitch dies. <laughs> I quit. Wasn't there several comments of Jesse wanting to like rote punch Ivanova and all sorts of. Oh, other- yeah. We were actually Ooh, worried when we. Lovely comments. When, when we interviewed Claudia, we were worried that Jesse was going to like not be okay. <laughs> Oh, she's the sweetest though. You can't, like, you can't be mad at her. No, but please, please put the part in there where we were watching um, uh, the purple episode. What's the purple episode where they do Born the... to the purple. Yes. And, and she's laughing and I called it a snarl. Please put that part in there. <laughs> okay. I'll go dig that up. Yeah. Great episode. Loved every bit of it. So excited to see the next one. I, I sent sarcasm. <laughs> Good, good catch. Justin, first impressions. I felt pretty rageful about Ivanova, just like Jesse did, but she she didn't go out like a bitch. She had she was in boss mode the entire episode, and I absolutely loved it. You know, I think my favorite term was death incarnate. Overall, yeah, I did, this is definitely an A plus episode for me. I and mean, I know some people ranked the last episode a little bit higher. The only part that I didn't like about this episode is I thought Sheridan's rescue went a little too easy for me. And I guess we'll kind of get that in the details for that uh, when we get to that point. Londo being the good guy now. The thought that Nar and Centauri would fight alongside of each other for any reason was unfathomable not too terribly long ago. Uh, so the fact that the league's finally coming together and backing Sheridan and, you know, supporting the fleet, I thought was pretty huge considering where things were earlier this season. I love the battle with the Shadow Destroyers. That that caught me. I should not have been surprised when those ships showed up, but I was. That caught me off guard. I was not expecting, like, like Ivanova said, I was not expecting them to adapt Shadow Tech that quickly. So that was a good surprise. I feel bad for my boy Marcus. You can definitely tell he's really shook about everything, as everyone is, but... Oh, overall, yeah, this is this is probably one of my favorite episodes of the season so far. Nicole. Well, I want to preface this by saying I was already a little emotional before watching this. 
And this was not the episode to watch if you were feeling emotionally fragile. I think I cried in this episode about six times at least. Just beautiful moments, sad moments, triumphant moments. Like, I also feel like I was just a hot mess. But overall, I have to say some of the things that were big highlights for me was I kind of loved the Lita Garibaldi Franklin dynamic. That was kind of fun to watch them like bicker and like, you know, go to we're on an adventure to save Sheridan. Like, it just kind of made me chuckle that whole uh, dynamic between them. Obviously, I was very surprised with the secret vote when Delin and Lanier rushed in there and they weren't told about the league meeting. I was like, oh, what the hell are they up to? What's happening? And when I heard Londo was the one who called it, I was like, son of a bitch, what is he up to now? And then I was like, at the end of it, when they're like, you know, we stand with Sheridan and we're here for you. Sheridan's not alone. I like started crying. I was like, oh my God, they hate each other and they're working together. And I was like a hot ass mess. So that one was just really touching and emotional. I really liked that. And I was very surprised by that. And then obviously I was excited to see Delenn and Lanier kind of, you know, having a moment right before that and expecting the worst and being surprised. That was pretty cool. Um, and then, yeah, just Ivanova's amazing rant. Who am I? I'm Susan Ivanova. I was like, I got to get that as a quote and like play that back in my head as like my hype track because she's a badass bitch. Obviously, what happened was heartbreaking. But yeah, overall, this episode was insane. Uh, obviously, I'm glad Sheridan was saved. I'm kind of with Justin on that. I thought it was a little too easy. Like, there was a gap of, like, time. Like, what happened after? Where did Garibaldi go? Like, I, it just was very... He's saved, and now they're, you know, he's reuniting with Delenn. I was like, wait, is this a hallucination? Like, the beginning? I was confused. But anyway, we'll get into that later. Other than that, I... I Really enjoyed Delenn's line of, I'll be most annoyed if you don't tell me what's going on. I think I'm going to use that from now on as well. Okay. And we'll go over to our first ones who have watched the entire show. Mike, first impression. This one's a lot, man. It's a big episode. Maybe one of the biggest of the series, in my opinion. And I I was here for it. I, I loved it. I, I think it's one of those episodes. It's, it's sort of telling to me that when almost every member of the cast is present in the episode, which doesn't happen very often at all you know the show's firing on all cylinders and that was definitely the case here kevin i love this episode as heartbreaking as part of it is it's got as you mentioned mike almost every character is in this other than poor zach and it's got it's got ups it's got downs the battle scene's great it's got some some great Ivanova soliloquy going on. Shout out to uh, guest star Masetta Vander, who is the uh, the guide in the in the tunnel system. She's been in some other stuff that I've seen her in. She's always very good, even though her part was pretty small in this episode. Um, yeah, I, I mean, as heartbreaking as it is, it's a great episode. Blake. I also really enjoy this episode. I think it's one of the stronger ones in season four. And especially, as Kevin mentioned, you've got all, or uh, sorry, Mike mentioned, You've got all the cast in this one almost. You've got your principal players. And it doesn't really feel jammed having them in there. I mean, it all fits within the narrative of what this story is going. I really like the part on Babylon 5 where you've got the council uh, making the vote to support Sheridan with that. And you've got another one of those great lines. You've got these two giants of actors with Andreas and with Peter there who deliver this speech about morality and politics and it being the smart thing and all together as one. And I love that line from Veer about politics and morality and agreement that doesn't happen and i just i love that line from veer but also the bit with ivanova on the bridge when she asks who are you and she just goes into that line of who she is and it's like i am death incarnate and i am the last thing you are ever gonna see i love that line from her because she is just about to totally whoop someone's ass at that point and then getting sheridan back into the mix and then him taking command of the fleet from the bridge of the agamemnon i mean just the symbolism of that and anyone who kind of knows some of greek mythology with that as well but that just to me was a fitting end to this episode yeah i i still stand behind that i think last week's episode is a better episode for many reasons but if you were thinking to nicole's point that this episode our last week's episode was moving too slow or didn't move the plot along well shit here we are and we are moving everything all the pieces are moving together even sheridan says at the end it's time for the final battle so we've got a lot going on and uh we'll go ahead and dive into it now i think we've got uh probably the biggest conversation is going to be about that fleet battle and what happens to a certain somebody during that so we'll save that for last let's first talk about 
Sheridan's escape and the work of Franklin, Lita, and number one to get that done. So Justin, let's go with you first. Like I said in my first impressions, I felt the whole kind of rescue itself was a little too easy. You know, Garibaldi's just like, I'm just going to walk in there like, you know, like I'm the big hero for turning in Sheridan. And for a high security facility, that has to be the most inept security team just to be like, uh, well, because it's you, go ahead. And even the the one chuckle I did get was the one door guard outside Sheridan's cell who like for word on word re repeated some kind of line about how TV is nothing but an arm branch of the liberal media and all that. And just the fact that Lita was able to just cause him a lot of pain just for saying that alone. But it's like, oh, I don't watch TV. It's a cesspool. It's all liberal controlled media. And I'm like, oh, where have I heard that before? Yeah, it's kind of like the scene from Star Wars where they escape in the Millennium Falcon and they're like, yeah, that was a little too easy. I wonder if they let us get away type situation. That's almost kind of the thoughts I had watching that whole thing. Like, it should have been harder. I mean, it should have been a lot more difficult to get him, to get him out of a situation like that. Unless it's just convenient writing and some completely incompetent security guards probably who if they weren't all blasted by by uh, ppgs and sheridan just going completely blasting a dude away multiple times killing him i think five or six times over that was a guy i guess a little underwhelming i guess i was expecting more out of that but that being said i did like the scene um with the resistance i thought that was actually really well done and I, I appreciated Lita for going boss uh, with the whole telepathic reading when number one said that she didn't even believe that Lita was telling the truth. And she still turned her eyes to her with her eyes completely fully black and said, well, do you want to see his hell or mine? And convinced her that he was telling the truth. Like she was she she stood up and didn't take any shit. So I really appreciated that. And they had the banter between all of them. I mean, Franklin definitely, you can tell Franklin definitely hasn't forgiven Garibaldi uh, for what he did, but he was still hurt. I'm glad he took the chance to hear his side of the story and understand the truth of really what happened. But I can definitely tell there's still not forgiveness there, which I think might be an interesting dynamic going forward once Garibaldi maybe tries to come back into the fold of the crew. Um, but I, yeah, just to sum up, really like the Mars resistance part underwhelmed by the escape itself and that's all i've got to say about that nicole well justin kind of highlighted some of the stuff i was going to talk about but i really enjoyed uh also the lita scanning garibaldi and finding out the truth and then basically making number one see it because i think in their mind they were going to kill him no matter what they had their minds made up and franklin was the voice of reason and i think because franklin's a doctor he said, you know, I owe it to him to hear his side or whatever. And, you know, he would have done it for anybody else because I believe that that's probably like his oath he took, right? He's not going to take a life. He's made an oath to save lives. So I think because of his morality and his being a doctor is is why he, he listened to Garibaldi, not necessarily um, because of loyalty. I don't I, I do also agree that I think he's still pissed and probably like not fully over what happened um but i do think lita scanning garibaldi and finding out exactly what happened was helpful and i think maybe once everybody's kind of aware of what happened and what she saw that maybe they'll forgive him but i don't know it's going to be an interesting road to watch but yeah when lita just looks over at number one with those black eyes i was like oh it's about to go down and she showed her has she, has she done that before where she's shown somebody somebody else's thoughts am, am i mistaken or has she not done that before lita has been very cautious like all telepaths we've run into well yeah investor to don't scan anybody unless they want you to be scanned that's why yeah. She even asked Garibaldi here, are you sure you want to yeah. do this? This is going to fucking hurt. Uh, with uh, number one, she didn't ask. She's like, okay, bitch, here's yeah. hell. <laughs> well, and like, I don't, I don't know if we've ever seen her like do anything like that before. So I felt like that was pretty badass to see her be like, watch this bitch, you know, and like show her what she can do. Um, I just thought like, okay, Lita's flexing a little bit here, you know? So as she should, because as we've talked about before, Lita kind of got shit on. So I'm glad Lita's kind of <laughs> asserting herself amongst everybody. And um, I just really, I really liked their dynamic when they were walking through the tunnels, going to, um, you know, to, to try to save him, their banter and her rant about suing. I was dying laughing. Like, 
it made me laugh so hard. I was like, I don't know why that is so funny. But she's like, I don't know how to do it, but I'm suing someone. And I was like, I feel you, sister. Like, but yeah, that whole Mars resistance thing. I mean, they kicked the shit out of Garibaldi and then they were just going to blow him away. And luckily, Franklin stepped in. And if they if he didn't, I mean, obviously, the show would have been different. But as watching, I was like, I'm just glad it worked out the way they it did. And they were able to save Sheridan. Kevin. See, that's the part of this episode that I, I, it's the only one that I have a beef with. It felt a little bit too easy for Garibaldi to get out of hot water. I know they've spent time developing the fact that, you know, Lita's skill set is very advanced, but it just felt a little too easy. Like it, it fit the plot too well to just have a five minute scene and move on from what's been almost the entire season of uh garibaldi down the rabbit hole that being said i'm glad that he's back in the fold in some way we'll see if it's that easy going forward or not but i i'm glad that garibaldi seems at least at this point to be completely back to normal and i did like some of the funny banter like you mentioned nicole there was some some good stuff in in the tunnels you know with uh franklin why can't we go any place nice that's good stuff other than that small gripe of mine i think this is probably my favorite or at least second favorite se- episode of the season like so i don't really have so much of an issue with the timing in this one i i think it works in fact actually the scene with garibaldi and the resistance was supposed to be in the previous episode mm-hmm. uh, as it was originally written it was supposed to be tagged on in uh intersections in real time however that episode worked out to be about eight minutes over and this one was about eight minutes short on runtime so they literally lifted that scene and dropped it uh into this episode to use with garibaldi and the resistance but I don't so much mind the pacing of that. I think that was kind of the natural resolution because he wasn't going to be able to run for long. He would have been a dead man if anybody would have got him. But it worked having Lita there, which in some case, yeah, is probably plot convenience of having Lita on Mars. But that really was, I think, always going to be the key to break any type of situation with Bester was going to be Lita because one, she's the only telepath not 100% loyal to Psychor who's strong enough that could really break those bonds and have an interest in helping Garibaldi and anyone else is probably going to want to take him out on site so I didn't so much mind that and even with the breakout from the cell I know they reference it as being kind of a high security staging area but I almost look at that as yeah it was security but they didn't exactly have him in their secure max location they had him somewhere that wouldn't be an obvious target to try to find Sheridan and probably didn't have their best and brightest there either because they're a little occupied, and I'm thinking at this point, Clark's probably running out of lackeys. So they have him at this kind of side site where, yeah, someone shows him, hey, you recognize me from the news? How about you let me in to see the guy I just turned in? You know, they're hailing Garibaldi as a hero, might as well use it, and waltz in there and see if you can't get him out. And it even came up on the Usenet, they talked about, oh, well, wouldn't there be cameras and wouldn't there be monitoring? And JMS said is when you've got people torturing folks, the last thing they really want around is recording devices that could be used later. I mean, even look at the U.S.'s own history of enhanced interrogations. We didn't really record those, and when we do have photos or recordings, it's usually when people start getting a little pissed about it. So they just don't want that kind of evidence around. So to me, it, it worked. I, I didn't so much see an issue with the pacing on it. Yeah, Blake, I, I'm sitting here, and I'm, you, you hit all my points already, I think, for the most part. But my question is, what else do you want? We get every point by point. They actually explain exactly what's happening. We get told that Garibaldi has to go through shit to get to where he's at right now. And in fact, he even gets beat to shit again. So I don't understand the whole it's too easy on that front because he has to go through all of that. He has to be scanned. And even we see what happens there. Number one, or Lita says they're not going to believe me anyway. And what happens immediately after Lita scans him? Number one doesn't believe her until Lita goes, to Nicole's point, beyond where we've ever seen Lita go before to make that happen. So on that piece, I don't understand the whole it was too easy. And then I also don't understand it was too easy on the taking it. Because, uh, you know, honestly, in my head, when I remember this episode, because I haven't watched season four in a very long time, I remember Garibaldi, Franklin, and Lita breaking in and getting Sheridan out in the like before the opening credits. I thought it was much quicker. So the fact that it takes the entire episode, I, I just don't, I don't, I don't see it. I'm with Blake on that. So I think one thing is we're we're conflating a little bit the redemption of Mr. Garibaldi with the escape of Sheridan because I don't think we're really talking about 
both of those things. At least I'm not thinking that at all. I don't think Garibaldi's out of the woods yet and going to be just welcomed back with open arms. I think what we're really talking about is just how fast and relatively easy it seemed for three people to walk in and walk out with like enemy number one of the state. And I have to echo that point. I also thought it was a little bit too easy. I also have to echo that I thought at least only one of the security guards that they came across was extremely gullible. Uh, the two guys by the door weren't having it, and they just got the crap beat out of them. And I'll tell you who else didn't consent to having Lita in their head was the guy that she looked at and went, pain! And then he just doubled over on the floor with kidney stones. As far as like the redemption for Garibaldi part, though, I did love that when Sheridan unloaded that gun and just looked like, <laughs> oh, I'm fine. Yes. I also, uh, I thought you were going to say this, Blake, and you didn't. I also love, this is not the first time we've seen somebody do the whole pain thing. Remember mm-hmm. Jeffrey Combs? Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> I think Lita did as much better than Jeffrey did, and I love um, Jeffrey yes. Combs. But yeah, I mean, I, and I don't want to harp on the point, but I do But I do get where the other guys are coming from, because I also felt like the escape, the, the uh, recovery of Sheridan felt like an event that warranted more. And maybe that's because I've watched five seasons of Money Heist. <laughs> At this point, like I expected a heist movie where they recover him. <laughs> and instead I got like a sea story in, in an episode. There and there was some on this on the Usenets too, and it, JMS even responded about kind of the scale because there were some people that thought they should have, you know, jumped in with the entire fleet and have been like a fleet thing to rescue and a whole big thing. And JMS even says like it, he wanted it to feel small, he wanted it to feel like a resistance thing and not be like this big massive fleet jump in thing and he said because that also would have taken away from the fleet's mission to get to earth if they stopped had to stop the entire fleet at mars to rescue sheridan and take out the sense of surprise there so there this discussion has been going on for 30 years by the way so this is nothing yeah yeah well now that um blake let the cow the bag last week too we can say as well is at this point when jms is writing this he thinks the show is being canceled there is not a season five. So he is trying to get a few things moving here too. Nicole. Before I get to my point, I just want to point out, there's another place where we have seen pain and someone crumple over in pain, but it wasn't Babylon 5. It was a lovely movie and book series called Twilight, just to let you know. I... <laughs> We claim no affiliation with that horse shit. I'm going to make an assumption that, Nicole, you're the only one who has watched all of Twilight. I'm just going to assume. I doubt it. Uh, anyone else in this? I have not seen it. I've read all the books and watched uh, the movies. I've I've watched most. I've watched all of the Twilight movies that came with a riff tracks. <laughs> that doesn't count. Just nice. that. I refuse to incriminate myself, and I refuse. Oh, to say never whether, mind. Whether whether or not I have, I I have one of those guilty pleasures. I see you. <laughs> I may have read all the books too. I'm not well, gonna lie. Wow. I love okay, it. Okay, Nicole. You, you guys are Justin, high. You guys are high. Twilight is awesome. I'm not saying I I'm like I'm not saying I can go back and enjoy it because I've watched it on like TV and I'm like I can't believe I ever thought right. this was cool. I love but. the acting of Twilight. It's so amazing. There are listeners out there that care about this. Justin, Nicole, what team are you on? Oh, team Jacob. Hell yeah. Justin. I liked the um I liked the dad, the doctor. Oh, Carlisle was the best, but if I had to team pick between Carlisle? Edward and Jacob. <laughs> I don't even know what this, I don't know what's going on. I do know that the werewolf imprinted himself on a two year old, right? That happened. Yeah. That that, that was that was the thing, right? I don't even know what's going on. Yes. Like, but he, it's he, not he like the, that. He got the it's, huts it's, for two year old. It's not welcome, like welcome that. Welcome to our Twilight bonus episode. Yeah. Oh, Listen, did, wait. did he or did he not? <laughs> it's not like that. Imprint yes. himself on a yes, baby. But it's not like that. Yeah. It's not okay. like that. Okay. Hold on, hold on, hold on. Cool. You and I just want to point out too, you guys go off on all these crazy tangents right. about Star Trek and shit. It's I don't true. know. Yes, this but is those the are one good. Thing. Hey, listen. I get, as, so, much as, as much as as, as, as as much as as much as Kirk is kind of an asshole and he's gone after some things he probably shouldn't have, a two year old was not ever one of them that oh, I'm aware boy. of. Usually I can jump right into the fray, but I, I, I have no idea what's going on. But Scott, in fairness, Kirk never met Cass. If 
he had, the two year old thing might have actually happened. Oh, yeah, oh, but then oh. there's Vo- Voyager sucks anyway. The end. Oh, you can send your hate mail to oh, Grace Seventeen Podcast at gmail dot com. Well, now that I've sufficiently derailed everyone, I had to go off on a rant because you guys always do. Yeah, but... we totally deserve this. Yeah. That's why I encouraged it. Yes. So, <laughs> but my point was going to be, Kevin, you said something about how like you thought it was too quick for Garibaldi to be out of hot water. Yeah. But the only people that actually know are Lita and Franklin. So he's still got to face everybody else, Delin and Jakar and, you know, everybody. So yeah, and, I don't and, think his battle's over yet. And Nicole, remember the last order Ivanova gave regarding Garibaldi that we saw was shoot him on site if he ever t- returns. Yeah. And that's still the order in place. Right. So, yeah. So I don't think it's going to be easy for him. Except, I, I don't think he's out of hot water. Except that he took part in releasing Sheridan. I I mean, I don't want to talk about another episode. Uh, I'll leave that for uh, my my previous flubs. But I will say, I just feel like it really is. It really was just a little too easy for a quick five minute scene. And then all of a sudden, you know, he's he's trusted to be trying to break out of a high, you know, relatively high security. We can debate about how, how high security it was, uh, you know, facility to get Sheridan out. The escape, though, is not something that I, I personally had a problem with. I mean, you, you cart the guy in that turned him in in there. And yeah, that's going to have some clout, clearly. Justin, going back to Mike, I am kind of in the same page as Mike, where I in no way... And I think Nicole even said the same thing. I in no way think that Garibaldi's forgiven. I think really Franklin only believed Garibaldi because of what Lita said, because he 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 wasn't even 100% sure himself until the scan happened. He's like, yeah, nobody may believe you, but I want to know. And if you're wrong, I'm going to kill you twice over. He said that exactly to Garibaldi's face. So I think, yeah, Garibaldi has a long, long, long way to go. You could see the way Sheridan was even looking at Garibaldi during the escape scene. Like, he still wants to punch the motherfucker. So he still has a lot of atonement um, to to give up for. So I don't think that in any way was too easy. It's just, to me, I still feel like the escape itself was a little too easy. Kind of like to go into like your, your question, Scott, about what exactly was more was I expecting. You know, I understand number one's reasons for not wanting to commit a lot of forces where they're stretched pretty thin, there's troops everywhere. But she even said herself, Sheridan promised them independence once this was all over. And she almost, to me, it felt like she almost took a nonchalant approach to Sheridan's capture, being like, well, that's all out the window, thanks to Garibaldi, and that's why we want to kill him. But, I mean, if you want to go after him, I'll kind of toss a couple guys your way, but I'm not going to commit a whole lot to this. To me, if I were number one, if I were the leader of that resistance, and my only hope at independence was sitting in a locked-up facility somewhere, me, I would have thrown almost everything I had at that. So me, I was kind of expecting a scene where the entire resistance gathers together and just, you know, makes a full on room by room, four by four battle, just blowing their way through this complex in order to find where Sheridan was, because that man is the only hope to get what I want. So I'm going to do everything I can to help him out instead of just being like, eh, I'll toss a couple of your guys. But if you guys fail, eh, you know, the battle carries on. So that's why I was a little disappointed in that because that's kind of what I was expecting to see from this. And it just didn't turn out that way. And it was just kind of like, oh, that's it. Okay, carry on. I'm sorry. Have you seen Babylon 5's budget throughout season four seasons? <laughs> I know. I was like, but the you're, budget's you're, gotten you're a lot asking, better. You're asking for Band of Brothers, which would have been fucking amazing, by the way. <laughs> that's kind of what I was expecting, not going to lie. So... You know, I understand the budgetary constraints and everything like that, but the budget is so much better this season than in previous seasons. So maybe they could have pulled off of something a little bit more intense. Kevin. So cool behind the scenes story here. So originally the way they scripted it, Franklin wasn't supposed to take part in any of the uh, hand-to-hand combat. And Richard Biggs being physically fit guy and rarely gets to uh, do that kind of thing on set in the part that he was in decides, hey, I'm really going to push and I, I really want to get into this. So he he finally is is, you know, talking to the director and the director's like, all right, look, usually I say no flat out to make changes, but I'll, I will talk to JMS. So they they break for lunch. The director, David Eagle, tries to talk to JMS. He can't be reached. 
So then he goes to Copeland or somebody and they, they give the green light. So they, they, you know, re choreograph the fight and he practices with, um, the, um, the stunt man and they film, they do two takes where Franklin is, uh, in the hand to hand combat. And on the second take, Richard Biggs absolutely decks the stunt man and, you know, really messes up his eye, not, you know, not anything permanent, but he had to go to the hospital emergency room. So they, what they ended up uh, using for the episode is the take where he absolutely decked the stunt man. And if you look really closely, you can see Richard Biggs for a split second go, Oh God, I really, I really hit the guy bad. Um, so, you know, they he, they only had like four shots so they had to pick from them. They ended up using the shot. But, um, you know, Richard Biggs, he he was the guy getting up at 5 a.m. To, to work out. So um, he definitely was uh, somebody that had had a capacity for uh, knocking somebody the hell out. And he sure as hell did on accident. He felt really bad about it, of course. But, uh, you know, no, 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 uh, no permanent damage. Thank God. Mike. Oh, shit. Well, this feels out of place now because that was a great story. <laughs> um, I was just going to say from a from a logistical standpoint, I'm I'm a guy that like always comes in and, and shits on the episode about something and then immediately backpedals and is like, well, I get why they did it this way. And so I'm about to do that. Uh, it doesn't it doesn't make sense that um, the rescue of Sheridan would have taken a long time. And I guess I just want to like point this out in my opinion. It, it, it's one of these things where you know he's a prisoner of, of clark and obviously clark's whole point we talked about this last episode is that they want to keep sheridan they want to flip him they want to have him paraded around in public and spouting you know his 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 own story about how he was wrong and clark was right and so you know this this whole operation has to be fast and it has to be quick to recover him because if it's not do you think Clark is going to let Sheridan get recaptured? Absolutely not. He has nothing to gain from that. He's going to be a spiteful bitch, and he's going to have John killed before he lets somebody take him. So that's why this couldn't be a the whole fleet jumps in and everybody looks up at the sky and there's a big protracted battle about taking Sheridan back. It just it wouldn't have worked. It, logically, it wouldn't have made any sense. They would have killed John long before anybody ever reached his jail cell. So I guess just, you know, pointing that out there, like, while I simultaneously did still feel that the whole recovery mission was kind of uneventful, kind of fast, um, it also made sense. It fit the the it fit the slot in the story that was left for it to fit. Justin. So the scene at the beginning where he's got this kind of neurological torture device on and he's hallucinating this scene where he's sitting with Franklin trying to describe how he got away and everything like that. And they're probing him for more information. And there's a lady sitting next to the interrogator who says, well, should we just bring his dad in and put a bullet in his brain to get him to cooperate? Was that confirmation that they were actually holding him? Yes. Or was that, okay. Because, be <laughs> Sorry, because Justin. to me, I kind of read it, no. And that's perfectly fine. But I kind of read it both ways. Like, well, should we go ahead and just bring him in from the other room and pop a cap in his ass? Or should we go and actually arrest him and bring him in and kill him? So I wasn't really 100% sure what that meant. Yeah, no, you because your prediction last week was that his he was not captured, and what is fairly clear at this point is the Clark regime was. does have David Sheridan. Yeah, well, so you bring that's... up an interesting point actually, because I didn't even think about that when I was watching this episode. Too much other shit going on, but well, they just granted, left his ass behind then too. I was going to say John was obviously drugged out of his mind, and no one else was thinking about capturing Sheridan's dad and getting him back. But at the point where they showed Sheridan kind of coming back to his senses, you would have thought that John Sheridan would Garibaldi have been like... also knew then, too, we, then, right? That's true. Here's, here's the thing. The, the, the assumption that was made last week that I didn't clarify last week that I think I need to clarify now is we were never, ever told that David was in the same facility. In fact, we were told the exact opposite, that David is not in the same facility. What we were told last week was William it passed by another interrogator and was talking about David, who is in a different facility. And I don't know how yeah. the wording actually was, but he is not I don't not remember in the that same... part. Okay. Yeah, and because because last week we talked about it, and, and a couple people assumed that he was in the same facility. But if you go back and, and I, I don't have the quote in front of me, but if you go back and watch last week's episode, 
of the show, they flat out say that he is in, he is in a different facility. Okay. So that's I'm glad, that's, I'm he's glad not, he's clear. He's not down the street or down the down the hall. So probably whether okay, so either another facility or Mars or somewhere on Earth. Then, but, well, yeah. I was gonna say, yeah, it, it makes sense that you say that now, and I'm glad you backtracked and clarified that because that was where I was going with it. And and it now that you've said that, it would make sense that I don't, I really doubt that John's dad managed to make it to Mars. If he was captured on Earth, he's probably still on Earth. Probably, yeah, you're right. My my thought on this is the last time Sheridan tried to save his dad, it didn't go well. So how about now we just try to save everybody and then save our dad after the fact? Is I'm Fair. guessing what his strategy is. Plus, Sheridan was really drugged out of his mind when they were talking about his dad. So I, I doubt that he really cognitively understood any of what maybe they were even. Saying. Yeah, maybe he doesn't even remember at this point. Which, by the way, my favorite line, and I don't have, I, mean, I know the Ivanova line is most people's favorite line, but one of my favorite lines is Sheridan basically saying, Garibaldi, I was going to kick your ass for some reason, but I don't remember why now. <laughs> yes, that was great. That was great. Okay, let's move into the next little phase. And this one's much smaller, but I think a lot happens in this. And that is the, the quote unquote coup by Londo and Jakar to get the Alliance to back the Earth Civil War. So uh, let's go to Jesse because she's been quiet. Jesse. I really enjoyed this scene. Like I really enjoyed the whole the whole plot because I expected, you know, it's Londo. So I expected Londo to be doing some really fucking weird shit again. And he wasn't. They were doing some really like feel good, like, you know, kumbaya type shit. I enjoyed, I enjoyed it a lot. Justin. Well, and I just wanted to, thinking back to Nicole's, uh, what Nicole said during her first impressions about how, and Jesse, you kind of touched on it too, about how when first, oh, Londo's got the league in a meeting and Delenn even flips out and is like, what? And that's kind of gives that feeling that, oh God, what's he going to pull this time? But I'm I'm, re I'm really glad to see they're taking the time to kind of, even though I think we're all kind of in agreement it doesn't erase all of his past sins and past crimes, but I'm glad that they're taking a little bit of time to establish him as at least trying to do the right thing. Um, and even like I even said during my first impressions, the fact that the Narn and the Centauri will willfully agree to anything and even smile about it. And they're going to fight side by side to me was like the biggest takeaway of that entire thing. Yeah. Because a lot of these, a lot of these other races, you know, like they mentioned the, the Drazi and the Narn and some of the other races like that don't always see eye to eye. Don't always like each other, probably shot at each other on numerous occasions, but they've still in the past have worked together and done so for quote unquote, the common good. This is the first time that you see the Narn and the Centauri actually, you know, agree to be, go into battle together and be happy about it. Nicole. Yeah, I thought it was a beautiful scene and hats off to the acting of Jakar and Londo. I mean, of course, Peter and, and Andreas always killing it. Um, but just, you know, they said, oh, we've been working together for months behind the scenes, just saying that Earth was the glue and they need to support them. And it was just, it was so well done and just so beautiful and unexpected. And I, I, I it did, it made me tear up. Like I, I started crying at the end of it because I was just like, wow, they've come so far from wanting to kill each other and like hating each other. And like I said before, they may or may never be friends, but I do think that obviously there's a mutual respect that they have for each other and they can move forward and work together. And this is just kind of like showing that both of them are able to put their shit aside for the common good. I forget who mentioned what Veer said about how politics and morality working together doesn't always happen. And that's so true, not just in the show, but in real life. You, you never see that. So you kind of have to hop on that when it happens. And um, it was just such a such a powerful scene, I thought. First thing uh, I have to go off that, Nicole, is actually I hate that fucking line. I, I, I hate it because it's so not true. Well, it's so I know. It's very cynical. I know. No, no, it's, yeah. it's, 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 I, I, I'm not going to get too heavy handed, but I'm a recovering politician. Every day I was a politician, I saw other politicians merge morality and politics. And so just because there may be a group of folks who don't, Right. They are they are the minority. And I don't care what party we're talking about. I saw I have seen Republicans and Democrats both do amazing work as politicians. Yeah. No. So when, whenever whenever people get beat up about this stuff, it really, really drives me nuts. And so that's why the, the cynicism to Mike's point yeah. of that line, it's a cute line. 
and Veer gets to say it and it's it's fun, but it's not true. Well, I agree with that, Scott. But, you, but I, Nicole, I, you just said it was true. Wait, you can I can I finish? <laughs> can I finish my point? Please. The problem is, is that the minority who aren't doing that are the louder ones, and that's all people hear about because the world is negative and focuses on the negative. But I'll go one step further, Nicole, and then I'll stop beating up on you on this one. But it's because people who are not usually negative still feed into it. Still, well, say, that's what I'm saying. The, the general and, public is stupid. <laughs> <laughs> but you're not. But you're not, Nicole. You're not stupid. And you said it. You said that usually doesn't happen. It's true. It doesn't happen. It happens every goddamn day. It's just that we as the public allow for the bullshit narrative to ring true because we say, oh, yeah, yeah pol all politicians suck. Well, Politi I don't say that. You did like 30 seconds ago. <laughs> but it doesn't happen on Babylon 5 all the time. My other thing, I'll get off that high horse. Uh, this is definitely a Londo scene. But I love watching the Jakar reactions. Andreas Katsoulis doesn't have many lines in this, but just the smile on Jakar's face when he gets up, because again, Dylan is confused as shit. Lanier thinks that something bad has happened. Londo is dragging out the punchline. And Jakar is just smiling ear to ear. And I just, we've come so far <laughs> with Jakar and Jakar and Londo that they have fun in a scene. And I love that so much. Nicole? I was going to agree I, with that because I thought that that was probably my favorite part when I said that the acting was so good and like just Jakar didn't have to say much. It was just his body language, his movement, his facial expressions. It was more powerful, I think, than anything. So I just I, I agree with you on that. But I don't know. I like when Veer gets sassy, too. So I'm going to back up that I enjoyed that line because whenever Veer can like be a dick, I'm, I'm for it. Anybody else on that scene or scenes? OK, let's uh, let's dive in to what everyone is so excited to talk about, and that is the Ivanova fleet action. We have a couple different things happen here, obviously, with the shadow reinforced ships, as well as what happens to Ivanova at the end. So, you know what, Jesse, you've been kind of quiet, and I feel that you have stuff to say. So, Jesse, what do you have to say about these scenes? I'm just really pissed off still. Like, you, you all laugh at me when I get all riled up about this, but, like, you can't kill Ivanova. You can't. And I'm going to be pissed off if he does. And then I'm hearing all these wonderful people on fucking Facebook talking about, oh, I can't name her because we haven't seen her yet. If it's another fucking female commander, I'm going to lose my shit because I'm not, I don't like change. I'm a creature of habit. We've noticed. I, I, en <laughs> I enjoy, I enjoy Ivanova. I finally gotten to a point where I love seeing her and everything she does is perfect. And it just pisses me off to think about, oh, tell me the truth. And John's like, yeah, no, you're fucking out of here, dude. You're dying. Like, you're you're out. We love you, but you're out. It just, the whole fucking thing. No, I'm not a fan. Zero out of ten would not recommend. <laughs> I don't I don't think Marcus would recommend that shop either. So no, I agree with you. Uh, Nicole, what do you got? I don't know if it was just me and typical me with the shipping, but I feel like there was a sweet moment with Marcus and Ivanova when the whole, like, she basically was like, I know what you said. Thank you. And I was like, oh, did she kind of flirt with him back? I got so excited. And I was like, oh, my God, is this going to happen? And then she gets blown up. I'm like, what the fuck, man? Isn't Let that them usually what happens? Other. Let isn't them love usually, each other. <laughs> isn't that usually what happens? Like, oh, they're going to get together. Oh, shit. A fucking brick yeah. wall falls in somebody's yeah. head. So I got very excited when I saw that. And then I my heart instantly broke for Marcus when he was, like, carrying her. And with him standing next to her, just, like, basically completely shattered and oh it was just so hard and I at that end scene when like you know Marcus was talking to her and John and her were talking am I gonna make I was just I just had tears running down my face I'm like she cannot die and I'm like what is Marcus gonna do <laughs> I was so sad Justin well and even where I was kind of thinking when I was watching that scene between Ivanova and Marcus was even though she didn't necessarily reciprocate the feelings she at least acknowledged him. And I thought that was pretty cool because they may not have ever have had a future, even if she does end up surviving. But just the fact that she acknowledged how he felt and appreciated it, even if she may not ever return those feelings, I thought was a really nice gesture on Ivanova's part. And then, yeah, just poor Marcus, man. Like you felt every ounce, you, you felt every tear he was shedding, just sitting there, just 
watching the woman he loves like slowly dying and it does and it's like it's like even it was hard for me to watch was just sitting here in that whole head brace and just everything like that and her struggling to talk and you can tell she's in obvious pain like you know claudia did a fantastic job in that scene like she really sold it that's another thing that really kind of caught me off guard with this episode was I thought everybody ivana was charging into battle and then I'm going to wipe the floor with every one of you. And then to me, like, I don't know, just something as simple as a collision. If she was going to go down, I was going to expect her to go down in a blaze of glory. Kamikaze into a shadow destroyer or whatever, or, you know, whatever the case would be. But just the fact that something small like that is what takes Susan Ivanova out to me also makes this a little bit more heartbreaking of, of a scene that... It wasn't, you know, she didn't, she, she didn't die on her feet like she probably would have preferred. But um, yeah, that's really, really well done writing for that entire part of it. Kevin. Yeah, that, that look of just helpless despair from Marcus is, is really heartbreaking. Yeah, especially after JMS uh, sets up a nice moment with the two of them and then all of a sudden just, you know, kind of rips the, the rug out. But um, yeah, there's, so Claudia, when she filmed this episode, she uh, she says that, you know, she does not struggle with being able to to cry or show emotion. You know, she's not one of those actors that needs to use, you know, a chemical or something or, um, you know, really bring some personal pain. She just doesn't have any any sort of, you know, trouble getting herself into a sad place. She she joked with the director, which eye do you want the tear to come from, the left or the right? <laughs> So that's uh yeah she's she's a boss pretty heartbreaking but fantastic acting. So Blake, I know you've been holding on to this. Oh, I've been for waiting a... for this for a year and a half. That's what I say. You've been holding on to this for a while, so I think you're up. So, you know, Kevin, you bring up Claudia and we we had the chance to do an interview with Claudia on the you know, one of our first bonus episodes and before she came on, so unfortunately Scott did not have this recorded, but Kevin I checked brings... today. By My the way. internet's going out. Sorry guys, bye. But Kevin brought up, do we want to discuss that Claudia is not on for all five seasons? And I knew damn well how this episode went. You've and I, got I to said be right fucking then, kidding me. I was going to have so much fucking fun with this episode. I wasn't there for that either. Yeah, so I had no No, you idea. were on the interview, you were Justin. On there. I was not on the interview with Claudia. I missed oh, you that. So oh. here's, no, I wasn't here's there. the thing, Blake. I don't think you should be telling them this now, but that's your choice. <laughs> I'm going to fucking quit. I, I love just you guys, don't think but this I'm is out. the place for this. But this is bullshit. Uh, there's a time shit? and place to give me give me shit, and that's fine. I deserve it because it was pretty bad. But I was afraid that one of the four of us was going to bring up with Claudia, you know, about leaving the show, and and I just completely just had a a a, a moment of stupidity, and instead of typing it out to just uh you know scott or to blake it was i just blurted out and oh there's newbies on here so what the fuck is wrong with kevin oh well he's an idiot but okay it was pretty funny it's Dude, been funny she, the whole way through does she really fucking die it's <laughs> a good prediction for beyond the rim it's really not fair that you're gaslighting people right now i just and and I, so what makes us even better is just jesse's reaction to this whole thing <laughs> You know, because going from when we watched The Gathering, yes. and it's, I fucking love Laurel, they better not do anything to her, she's the best character ever, to who the fuck is this bitch, I fucking hate her, to now this Jesse with this is bullshit, she better not well, die, she better not I've leave. been so excited God, for Jesse to find out that Laurel comes back in season five. <laughs> I hate you all. I'm fucking done. <laughs> Gaslighting at its finest. Okay. Yeah, this hey, is you know, bullshit. This is we've, bullshit. We've done it to Justin enough. It was time to do it to somebody. Else. <laughs> yeah. I've been gaslit like a whale whale oil lamp. So <laughs> I tell you me. what, right when Ivanova shut her eyes, I swore I heard angel wings. Shut the fuck <laughs> up. <laughs> That's the best. <laughs> That's the fucking best. Justin's about ready to throw his chair through his Zoom screen. At me. That's fucked up. That's funny as hell. But that's yeah. not you were right, so I mean. Scott, the that's the funniest like, goddamn thing you ever said. I was like, who the fuck is, what are you talking about, Angel Wings? I was gaslighting you too. I was like, the fuck are you talking about? Yep, you were totally right. 
Oh, wait till they find out that it's section 13 that brings her back. <laughs> Bureau 13, oh, sir. Oh, Bureau 13. God, God damn it. Bureau 13. <laughs> oh, God damn sorry. it. <laughs> Nicole, what do you have? <laughs> you know, my point might be mute, but I'm gonna say it anyways. <laughs> um, Kevin said something about the uh the look on Marcus's face of like hopeless desperation. And when we first see Delenn and John walk in, Sheridan walk in, she's like, I made the bed flat, how she likes it, even if they said it wasn't, it was bad luck, and I don't know what else to do. And and he's just trying so hard to do anything he could. And that really hit me in the gut because if you've never been in that helpless moment before I've been there where you want to help and you want to do there's literally nothing you can do you just have to sit there and hope and wait and and hope for the best you know what I mean that Nicole you're making it really hard for me to make the raunchy joke I have loaded (laughs) (laughs) well it was just so hard to watch and so relatable that uh, it was just another example of like JMS's writing being awesome and also him giving us a little bit and then taking it away like taking something away Well, Mike, you can't bury the <laughs> French well, we could have taken what it is... away. I guess Marcus is like, well, damn, another night with the crusty sock. Jesus Christ. Ew, God. I sympathize. <laughs> Y'all need Jesus, okay? Y'all are crazy. Well, you know what? The You've dark that for a the, while. The dark, shadowy parts of Justin's brain where his name oh, is whispered in hushed tones. <laughs> Are you Voldemort? Yeah. No, the uh, <laughs> no, honestly made me wonder like if she's laying there on her deathbed and Marcus is she knows how Marcus I feels. really, is really she... uncomfortable we're with we're, right. with where this is going. <laughs> there there is a side she's universe book there. about this and we won't talk about it yet, but there is. But is she gonna like be like, all right, you know what? Come come hit it before I go. No, like, that's where I thought you were you? going. We're, I'm not talking fanfic here, I'm talking <laughs> legitimately published by Warner Brothers Media. There's a story. That I won't go into detail oh. on, Justin. Is it a Twilight <laughs> crossover? You shut your mouth. Does Marcus <laughs> glimmer when the sunlight hits him? There's one way where you can live. Crossover. <laughs> Is it, time out. I don't shit on your Star Trek. Don't shit on my Twilight. <laughs> you should. Fifty Shades is a bad no, fanfic no. of Twilight, right? That's exactly what it is. There's no BDSM in Twilight. I don't know. It's torture for the audience watching it. So. Oh my god! Legitimately, Fifty Shades started as a Twilight fanfic, right? Okay. Yes, that's exactly. Really? Are I you, did not know serious? that. It's just as bad I no as idea. a fanfic. If you guys come for Hunger uh, Games next, I'm coming for oh, all of you. Oh, oh, oh! I'm on your side on Hunger Games. No, no, no problem there. Uh, Blake, hi. What do you got? Hi. So let's try to pull this back to Babylon 5 for a minute. Uh, I was told you're a better host for this reason. You know, who knows? So I kind of wish Emily was here because Emily had some thoughts on this too. But thinking about leftover shadow tech and what the shadows may have left behind and seeing those Earth Star Destroyers jump in, those modified Omega class ships that had the bio hulls that looked a lot like the shadow vessels they had the advanced weapons so earth has been playing around with shadow tech we know that now we've seen evidence of that before but they've modified it relatively quickly to put it out into their ships also to have these advanced omega class destroyers kind of pressed into service to go after sheridan's fleet so that kind of answers the question about what are, what has Earth been doing with Shadow Tech that they've had access to. So curious to see kind of, I know, Justin, you were on that train as well a little bit with the Shadow Tech, but Emily was the big one there. So I'd be curious to see kind of what your thoughts are there, Justin. Yeah, I mean, I for one can't wait to hear what Emily's thoughts are, and I hope maybe in the next recording she gets to talk about it for a little bit. But, I mean, yeah, I wasn't expecting it to show up immediately, almost. But the fact is, whoever did it, didn't do a really good job because the White Star Fleet really didn't have that much trouble mopping up, mopping that up. So, you know, yeah, they may have infused some shadow tech into their ships, but it really didn't do them any good because they got taken out pretty quick. Yeah, they certainly didn't portray it as being a very, a very hard fight. And especially when half of the fleet, you know, tied its hand behind its back and they managed to get the job done anyway. But it did kill one of the main characters, maybe. Uh <laughs> Jesse's gonna kill you. <laughs> Motherfuckers. There's two points on that, Justin, and um both of them I, I wish would have been said in dialogue in the episode, because I'm not one of those who usually likes like, oh well, if you read this, this, and this, you know more. But the two things that JMS has said about the fleet is one, it was designed to take out Earth ships. It was meant for the Civil War. They did not expect the White Star fleet to be what they dealt with. Well, they kind of alluded to that in the episode. They kind of did. Because 
because when they were doing kind of their battle plan and Ivanova was telling the airships to stand down was because she, I think she was talking to Marcus, yeah. had this fear, had, had this fear that they're going to go after the airships first because then they can use this as a whole propaganda piece about how this is just an alien fleet coming after us all. So it wouldn't shock me at all if they were made to specifically target the other Earth destroyers, and especially if they can manage to take out like a prestigious ship like the Aggie. The other thing is, and again, this was not mentioned in the show, which is a problem, I think, but they were launched early. They were not ready yet. So that fleet was launched early because they knew Sheridan's fleet, quote unquote, Ivanova's fleet, was bearing down on Earth. So they launched early. Mike? Well, and from a practical perspective, too, you have to imagine that Earth probably knows relatively little about the White Stars because the only direct encounter that they've had with them, as far as I remember, is when the White Star came to Mars and blew up the, the buried And they were there at Proxima as well, too, but that's the other time. That's true, but I mean... Well, I guess what I'm saying is they've had relatively little experience with them until the Civil War campaign started and the Shadow Conflict. Ended. Yeah, that's and true. At that point, you don't have any turnaround time in your R&D department to refocus taking out White Stars instead of Omega Class Destroyer. You already Good know point there. It. Justin. But don't you think, though, they would have had some intel? Because even when they captured that one officer, he said not everyone who's defected has truly defected. There's been There's been a lot of, like, maybe spies who are quote unquote defectors passing information back to earth. So I would think they may at least have some decent Intel unless, unless they're not on board any of the, any of the white star fleets and they're just staying strictly on their own ships. Well, they're most, most of the white star crews appear to be Rangers and or Mimbari. Mimbari. So that's true. I mean, and I think it's, it's probably true that they probably did have some, but not enough to yeah, work. You know? I mean, you can have all the intel in the world that these weird looking Vorlon slash Membari ships are around, but if you don't know what they're powered by, you don't know what their yeah, weapon systems are, yeah. nothing you can do. Blake? That's the point I was going to make is I'm sure, and they've even indicated on screen is they know the profile of the White Stars. They know that they're shared in ships, but as far as their actual capabilities and full specs, I doubt that they have that and that even people within the fleet that they're only giving that type of information to very trusted sources. The other thing I find interesting with the advanced assurers, I mean, Mike, you mentioned the R&D time to adapt to a White Star, but even the R&D time to adapt Shadow Tech into Earth, I think they made a very smart choice here production-wise of not trying to design a new ship. And, and I like that. I think that makes sense. We're not seeing a brand new ship roll out that we've never seen before. This is still the basic Omega class yeah. design with these modifications added on. You're, you're so I like that touch. <laughs> just just like every project I've worked on in my professional career, you're haphazardly slapping new shit onto an old busted frame. <laughs> uh-huh. That, that's, you can find that Mike's LinkedIn would... if you'd like to hire him. <laughs> <laughs> this sounds like my entire time. I'm really good at it. Human services. <laughs> Anything else, guys, on the, sh the episode itself before we move on to questions and predictions and Jesse tries to kill me again? Okay. <laughs> well, let's do just that. So for those of you who are joining us for the first time, our newbies, again, have not watched past Between the Darkness and the Light. And so we are going to ask them for any lingering questions they have about this episode and then give us any predictions what the, we have for the next coming few episodes and the rest of the show. And by the way, next week's episode is entitled Endgame. So read into that as you will. So let's go to Nicole first. Questions and predictions. Where is Garibaldi? Obviously, we know where Sheridan is and pretty much everybody. Uh, but where is Garibaldi? And is he still on Mars? Um, and also, are Franklin and Lita back with the crew? Or are they still on Mars, too? Um, just where is everybody? Nicole, uh, I'll actually answer that for you. Because I think okay. it, it's not a huge spoiler. Remember, uh, for Franklin and Lita, they didn't go to Mars to find Sheridan or to deal with um, Garibaldi. They were sent there by Sheridan. We don't know why yet, but we do oh, know that's right. They okay. do. We do know they have the telepaths with them. So they're there. All right, noted. Um, and then I guess I'm going to say my prediction. I'm not going to let you guys gaslight me, and you're probably going to make fun of me after. But I think Ivanova's going to survive. I don't think she's going to die. Justin. Questions, predictions. First question is, what? where is Bester and what is he up to right now? Is he still going to be a factor? Like, I guess, you know, next week's episode's called Endgame. So like you said, Scott, take that as you will. But does Bester get captured? Does he disappear like a Mendeley and we never see him again? 
Like, is there going to be like some kind of manhunt for him? I'm kind of curious where, what story Bester has left in all this. And I guess maybe it's partially been, uh, I, I guess like they're set course to Mars. They're on their way to Mars, right? When they get to Mars, will Franklin be able to find some way to save Ivanova? Because, you know, how much, how much about Earth anatomy or how much about human anatomy do the Mimbari really know? May, will Franklin maybe be able to find some way to save her? And if not, and if and if this is the end for our dear Ivanova, are we going to have to watch her death scene, or is like the next episode going to pick up and she's just going to be gone, and maybe it's her funeral or something like that? How is this loss going to affect everyone on the station and in the fleet in general? Because I assume it's going to mess up a lot of people. Assume that the fleet eventually gets to Earth. What will Clark have there waiting for them? Are there more of these shadow shadow destroyers? Is there going to be like a big armada sitting there at Earth waiting for him? The mention of a war tribunal has piqued my interest because I have studied a lot of Nuremberg. I just finished a really excellent book about the Japanese war crimes tribunal. So how is this going to, if there is a war tribunal, how is this going to take place? Will Londo have to go before a war, a war tribunal? And an answer to his crimes, or is this going to mostly be about just strictly Earth? Really, the the only thing I'm going to say, I don't have any major predictions other than, you know, I think that they're going to take Mars probably in the next episode. I don't know if we'll get to Earth in the next episode or if they even get to Earth, but I think they're going to at least take Mars and liberate Mars. And I think Sheridan's going to make good on his promise to give them full independence. But just the sight of the Aggie leading the fleet to Mars and Earth, I think is going to be a tremendous sight. And I think it was very fitting that Sheridan's at the helm of that ship during the final stages of this war. Yeah, Justin, I'm glad you brought that because I didn't really hit on that scene too much, but I, I just, I do love that we're going to quote unquote, have the final battle with Sheridan right back where he started when we first met him on the bridge of his ship. And again, as Sheridan has said many times, this has to be Earth's fight. So the fact that he's coming in, not on an alien ship is, is smart. Jesse questions, predictions. Uh, I would like to predict that you kindly piss off, sir. Um, <laughs> you know very well, after knowing wow. me for 20 years, that's not happening. What else you got? Well, my first question is how long do I have to fucking wait until Ivanova dies? Because I, I don't know if I'm going to last another whole fucking episode or seven. My predictions, just because I would like to go on with my happy little life, is that she doesn't die. And she comes back and is, you know, greater and stronger than ever. Cyber Ivanova. <laughs> Robo Ivanova. That's the it. Million dollar Russian. <laughs> Bro, they saved the little fucking kid. Well, how can they not save Ivanova? Like, stop it. God and science sent me. <laughs> I mean, I'd be fine if she was Robo Ivanova. At right. least she'd still be here. Exactly. I'd probably be fine with it too. <laughs> <laughs> On that note, by, by we, the power of God and anime. Oh no! <laughs> Again, there, there's an extended universe story that is almost as bad as Twilight. Okay. Um, that note, <laughs> Nicole is just giving me the death stare now. I just can't believe you guys are married. Where is the romance? Come on, have <laughs> some romance and love in your life, you cynical bastards. I, I'm sorry, you're married, and there is still romance? Question mark. Well, we're not married yet. That's why. That's, that's why. why. That's why right <laughs> there. there. That's the key. We're, we're engaged. We're not married yet. You're still in the honeymoon <laughs> phase. Just wait. Okay. Yes. On that note, we're going to go ahead and end it here with our newbies. We're going to send them out the airlock, much like Ivanova's corpse. And we will. <laughs> <laughs> you are so wrong. Oh, the look on Jesse's face right now is so perfect. <laughs> and we will be here next week. To well, discuss. some of us might be Scott. I just <laughs> saw that look from Jesse. One of us won't. Man. <laughs> She's two and a half hours away from me. She I is. feel safe. I'm Sharks, an hour and a half wouldn't. away from you. That's true. You are that is there. not safe, my friend. I'm just <laughs> yeah. saying. Holy cow, man. On a Dark. scale of one to ten, you're fucked. <laughs> Dark Scott showed up tonight. <laughs> on a on a scale of one to Dark I could be there Scott. absolutely tonight. Um, <laughs> keep it up. Hey, you know, Damn. we can get a beer. Okay. <laughs> It's not going to be a beer time, sir. <laughs> it's not going to be a beer time, sir. <laughs> On that note, when Blake hosts the end game episode, we will talk <laughs> to our newbies again. Uh, uh, just scheduling, I think I talked about this last week too, but we have uh, three episodes left in season four. And then we are also going to be doing the Babylon 5 movie in the beginning. And then we'll do our season four wrap up. So we've got four weeks, guys. 
And then the fifth week, we will have season five, the it's last crazy. season of Babylon 5. So we're getting there. We're moving along. In the beginning, it's just a montage of all the anonymous, right? <laughs> You're really asking for it tonight, okay. sir. <laughs> Jesse's going to end all of you. Just because I haven't known you 20 years doesn't mean I won't punch you, too. <laughs> Is is next week's episode when Thanos shows up? Yes. I'm done. Okay. Yes. We've Notice done. I've been quiet because even though I live five hours away, I know even I'm not safe. <laughs> Kevin, <laughs> Kevin, I will say of the two sci-fi episodes <laughs> named Endgame that we probably will reference on this show, this is the better episode. Wow, I didn't even get that? that connection. Kevin's joke. <laughs> I just caught it too. I am very drunk. <laughs> I am very drunk. <laughs> Voyager Endgame was a really bad series finale. Okay. So, newbies, be gone, and we will be back after the credits for those who want to hear answers to these questions. And, Jesse, in about a year from now, when you listen to this episode, I love you. And enjoy the Beyond the Rim. Until next week, when Jesse buries my corpse, I've been Scott, and with me has been... Mike. Fucking Jesse. Kevin. Justin. Mike. And Nicole. Bring a shovel. Bye, fuckers. It's been fucking fun. I can't, I don't know how to get out of here. Goodbye. Thank you for listening to Gray 17, a Babylon 5 podcast. You can find all the places to listen to and watch this podcast at anchor.fm slash gray 17 podcast or youtube.com at gray 17 podcast. We want to hear from you, so join the conversation at Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, YouTube, or Patreon. Be sure to subscribe and leave a review where you are listening to or watching this podcast. Gray 17 is not affiliated with, and the podcast has not been prepared, approved, or licensed by Warner Brothers or any other owners of the Babylon 5 copyright. All clips included in this podcast are the intellectual property of the respective copyright holders. They are included here for purpose of review, and no infringement is intended. The opening and closing themes are available from Falling Matter on YouTube. And what's out there? The rim. And beyond that? The truth. Jesus. You guys are evil. <laughs> wow. <laughs> I want to reiterate that I'm very drunk. <laughs> I'm crying. Hold on, give me a second. Oh, shit. Okay. Is there, is there anything we want to discuss aside from the questions and predictions? Not at all. Our last wills and testament might be appropriate. Uh, <laughs> whew, let, me, let me take a moment. Oh, she is going to absolutely destroy you guys. Uh-huh. I'm waiting for a year from now when she gets to listen to this. <laughs> <laughs> and then it all cycles back it's gonna be great okay welcome back to beyond the rim again this is a spoiler section so if you have not watched past between the darkness and the light or just forgot what happens next this is not the section for you for all those who are sticking around we'll dive into the questions and predictions from our newbies and again a year from now when jesse's re-listening to all of the beyond the rims hi love you okay questions guys first one where is mr garibaldi is he still on mars <laughs> up your butthole jesus mike <laughs> i don't know he's somewhere yes yeah, he's, he's still, still on he's mars born. he's still on mars he will take an active role in next week's episode helping to get the uh telepaths onto the ships which we'll talk about here i'm i'm, I'm sure so lita franklin and well, garibaldi are still on mars well i kind of think that's a bit of a insurance policy play i mean i know it's not in the script it's not anywhere within the story but i see that as kind of an insurance policy play that you don't necessarily want to bring garibaldi back up to the main fleet that you've True. got him there on mars where he's relatively contained yeah you're going to have him help with this operation but yeah he's not going to sink anything major yeah no i i can't go along with that because they've got him in probably the most important op of the war to make mm. sure that the final battle works and that, I think, is my biggest problem, which I didn't want to say too much more on the main recording. But the fact that they they do seem to, yeah, maybe there's some residual feelings, but they seem to completely trust him. They they haven't made any mention or or given us any reason to think that they don't. And they involve him in not only the op to, to get 
Sheridan back, but then also for, you know, the, the telepath op in the final battle. So to me, it just, it seems too easy, but again, as you pointed out, I think the real reason for that, that it seems you know, possibly a little hurried or, or or a little too convenient is, as you mentioned, Scott, the fact that they thought this was going to be it for Babylon 5. Yeah. So they didn't really have a choice uh, whether they were going to completely flush it out or not. They had to push through and do it. And well, as Blake mentioned last episode, the last episode was supposed to be the season finale. So... We've got a whole season to deal with this kind of stuff. And by well, and I'll also point to it, and I kind of, I get what you're saying, Kevin, but I also look at, they've, they've got him there with Lita, who's the one person who could, you know, if he was up to anything, could fry his entire system with a blink of an eye. Sure. So I, I think that that's why I kind of get that they have him more in a contained role. It's not an insignificant role, but I definitely think they have him more contained there than putting him up with the rest of the fleet and everybody else at this point. So you find it completely believable, and, I, and I'm not saying I don't, but completely believable right. that Lita would be able to see anything that was residual left by Bester. He's been augmented I, I by do the with, world. Given okay. her Vorlon modifications, yes. If if we're talking just a standard, you know, telepath, commercial telepath, no. Even Lita, if it was a level 12, you'd probably feel pretty comfortable. Lita's yeah. at higher than level 12. Okay, the, then why I, don't they see the block where he can't do anything to harm um bester because that's left over is that and she didn't see that did but uh, now did she, we're not just... did she not mention it there we go or or do you have to know what you're looking i mean we don't know what the mechanics of telepathy <laughs> so either she left out that part or didn't see it or she'd have to know to look for it i guess that that plays into why i i it feels a little bit plot convenient to me i i agree with kevin honestly though i i get how you can explain it away but at the end of the day lita has become a major like MacGuffin to the plot line in a way that is a little bit hard to swallow i get why because of the expediency and the need for it but it's it doesn't it doesn't translate super and yet franklin and to to an extent garibaldi seem to be the only ones that treat her with you know the the modicum of respect that she certainly deserves the rest of them particularly sheridan just seems to well and zach zach treats her well but my my point is they just like they they use her for the most important stuff including this and then they just don't really care that much for her yeah. and it's just it's crazy the one thing I, I i i can't go that far for one i mean if you're gonna say well why didn't she bring up this there is a million things in every tv show why didn't this character bring up that because it wasn't in the script but the one thing i do like about this that kind of goes along with what we're trying to say here that she went a little bit farther than what she usually does remember when she was talking not talking but communicating with the telepath who had been augmented by shadows a few episodes ago she didn't go all black eye and in fact, Emily brought that up. Like, did she go black eye like she has before? She didn't. Because at that point, she's just communicating with a telepath. She doesn't have to go Vorlon. But then this one, where she actually says she has to break through a P12 block, she does go full Vorlon. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, there's at least they thought about that. I can see where you're coming from on the plot contrivance and everything else. I, I just don't worry about it as much, I guess. Yeah. But at least they did actively show... She's doing something different this episode than what she did a few episodes ago in Med Lab. Mm -hmm. So we have discussed the Bester. So where is Bester? What is he up to? Is he still a factor in the Civil War? Question mark. Oh, we'll see him again. Yeah, we see him at the end of the season uh, threatening Sheridan that if his lover was used in the uh, the final assault with the telepath, that Sheridan's a dead man. And of course, Sheridan was smarter than that and didn't. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he just killed other people. It was mm -hmm. fine. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> he committed war crimes with other people. But I think, too, what's going to, and I think especially Justin will notice this, not everybody, is again bester in that scene we'll see and he continues to refer to him as my telepaths he doesn't care if clark wins he doesn't care if sheridan wins he doesn't care if anyone wins he just wants to make sure that his telepaths are on a path to where sooner or later as lita referred to last week or two weeks ago the when the war happens that his telepaths win 
That's all he cares about. Everything else is just minutia. Homo superior wins out. Yes, he's Magneto. I've said it before. He's Magneto. It'll be a fun argument next week to see how many of us agree that there that Sheridan actually committed a war crime with this one. He absolutely 100% did. I think he had to. Will Franklin be able to find a way to save Ivana on Mars? She's not no, going he's to already Mars. Found it. Well, yeah, but she and she's not going to Mars. <laughs> she's not going to Mars. She, uh, because Mark is going to go back and use that machine from season one. Yeah, again, callbacks. <laughs> but yeah, so she uh, she and Marcus are not going to Mars. And by the time Franklin finds her, she will be right as rain. Uh, and it's all because Lanier can't fucking pause for a second when answering. <laughs> yes, it's, it's, it's damn Lanier. <laughs> I'm, I'm looking forward to talking about Claudia Christian's acting in yeah. that scene after yeah. she's saved and Marcus is dead. That is... I should have most him. definitely her best acting of the series I, I i agree with you 100 kevin i would actually say a second runner up is not her line delivery on this uh, on the, the main line i do enjoy the line but when she is on that table she is acting her heart out too oh, yeah. with the oh, they yeah. won't tell me the truth john you're my friend am i gonna make it yeah That's some really good acting too i didn't i didn't like the addition of the sweetheart line in her soliloquy on the bridge that was uh, part of it i didn't love but um yeah all all three of these scenes that we're discussing are all you know pretty good but i i agree her her scene in the in the sick bay or whatever was was top notch too and we can definitely go into this more when we kind of start talking about and again when we got to be careful about this and i know we weren't this week but, ah! <laughs> but, but okay but Ivanova is not gone. We have, we, she will fit. And that's the thing too, even in this scene is filmed and JMS made it very clear when the scene was filmed, she was not leaving. The contract dispute happened after yeah. this episode was filmed after sleeping in light was filmed. So she's not gone because she'll be in sleeping in light. And then she'll also will be in the road home. So mm -hmm. we will get mm -hmm. more Ivanova. It's just going to take Jesse a while. So her other question was, how long do I have to wait to see Ivanova die? She's not going to Jesse. It's okay. She'll be back several times it's okay get her own ship yes but I, I the one thing i wanted to throw out there too and we'll talk about this more i'm sure when we talk about her acting this is my point i was getting to is in the show in the 90s claudia christian is relatively young and relatively a new actor I, she's done a few things here and there but this is her first real main show real main character and so she knocks it out of the park mm -hmm. and she continues to we've kind of already uh, answered the next one are we going to have to watch ivanova's death scene no because we will never see ivanova die well that's not true. And the road home will see her explode, but that's neither here nor there. Truth. <laughs> uh, how is her loss going to affect everyone? I love this question because, again, it assumes that we're losing her, yeah. which we kind of do. So I do like the fact that it will affect everyone because we do get Lockley, and that does change the dynamic of season five quite a bit. Which is but, funny because Jesse's like, please tell me we're not going to have another you know, female commander or captain. I was like, well, funny thing I, about that. <laughs> I, character. I, I don't want to assume too much on this one, but knowing Jesse, I think that she will like Lockley. I don't think she's going to like Lockley as much as Ivanova, but Lockley's personality, I think Jesse will begrudgingly start to like. She's going to take her time to, to come around. Her for at least a third of the season, though. Well, she did that with Ivanova for two right, seasons. Right, exactly. But um, yeah, so... And of course, no one has gathered this yet is we are going to get a loss this season and it's going to be Marcus. So yeah. mm -hmm. we'll see how people deal with that loss as well, too. Oh, yeah. It's um, yeah, he's he's my favorite character mm -hmm. and it's it's rough, but this is why he's one of my favorite characters or my favorite character, because he's the righteous one who is like, nope, I can't live with that. He's like, I've got a way out for her and I don't care about myself. You know, he's he's the hero of the story for for that yeah. episode. Yeah. And Kevin, you know, I've noticed in this watch through more than others is this is his story that's been laid out for us from the beginning. It was absolutely foreshadowed when he was talking oh, yeah. about his brother that he has always been looking for something to live for rather than to die for. Even during the Rangers, it wasn't to live. Yeah, he's kind of it got was a to wish. die. Yeah. yeah. And so he he will without hesitation mm -hmm. step up and sacrifice for Ivanova because that's what he's been looking for a way out yeah he just doesn't feel himself you know totally worthy of you know love or being the hero and this definitely is a way for him to go out giving himself some meaning that um 
he hasn't felt before it's it's tragic but it absolutely makes sense with the writing and mm -hmm. you know as as we pointed out and i feel compelled to point out one more time this was the plan she was going to continue on as as a character and it didn't work out that way for other reasons but this was the plan and the plan was executed flawlessly I'll talk about this more in our Beyond the Rim next episode, but Claudia does go into this in her autobiography about the contract dispute. So we'll talk more about it there. But honestly, after listening to JMS and Claudia both talk about it, it really is frustrating that they didn't get this figured out because it truly comes down to a he said, she said, but also it comes down to one of them was out of the country when the contracts were being signed and there was a miscommunication and they were pissed at each other and a whole lot of stupid shit happened to end up her leave with her leaving the show and it should not have happened. Seems like there's still some bitterness too, which is unfortunate. I feel that a, I, I feel that too, but I think a lot of it did get cleaned up when she returned for the road home. That's good. But yeah, I'm hopefully we'll get a chance to chat with her again about it now too. So the newbies will be involved in that conversation more too. But. Well, I think one of the kind of digs that hurt too and didn't contribute well was there's the episode of season five where yes. it follows the two construction workers around for the day. And one of them makes a comment about Ivanova leaving and he, the other says, yeah, it was a pay dispute. And yeah. just to throw that little oh, that's in, just wrong. didn't really help matters. That she, that added some fuel to the fire. If, if anything, well, JMS will clearly claim that he is a prick. So. Well, I was just going to say, that's JMS being JMS, right? Yeah, he's, <laughs> he's clearly said he's a dick. <laughs> okay, moving right along. What does Clark have waiting for them at Earth? Are there any more Shadow Destroyers at Earth waiting for them? No, just, you know, humongous, you know, gun array around the planet no yeah big deal. and a few more normal destroyers which will some will some will will even see next week that some will uh not a uh, fight some will fight and those that do fight get the uh, telepaths that uh screw with them so we're almost to the end there and <laughs> i love justin and his getting into the weeds on this how will the tribunal work who will go before the tribunal <laughs> there's not gonna be one but there's one of threatened. The president flat out says, oh, yeah, if you don't play ball with me, we can still stick you in front of a tribunal. Oh, yeah, sure. But <laughs> there's not actually going to be one because Sheridan takes the deal. Yeah. And, and I think I of don't think uh, Earth was happy about it. No, especially after they find out what the deal entails. Right. But I think Ivanova was completely uh, in, in her mind correct because this is what she's used to when a military uh, sure. issue is dealt with and then the the reports are ran if somebody did something wrong there will be one sure. she doesn't and she's she doesn't i don't think she knows at this point who's going to be standing in front of it she could be standing in front of it or the other guy could be standing in front of it well it's just somebody's going to have to relay their story one way or the other <sighs> okay prediction time ivanova will survive both nicole and jesse agree to this i think jesse out of spite but nicole <laughs> B does believe that Ivanova will survive this incident. Nailed it. <laughs> yeah. They'll be very happy. But it is a 50-50 shot, so, you know. <laughs> yeah. I think it's it would be fascinating in, in another universe if JMS had known a few weeks or a few months earlier that he was not going to have Claudia back. Would he have continued on? Because, as Kevin, you mentioned, this is the plan. This was the plan. He he's he flat out it. said he would not have killed Marcus if he had known that Claudia was going to be leaving. Yeah, him. yeah, you're completely right on that. What I'm getting at though is, would he have killed Claudia? Oh, oh, I don't, I don't know. That's what, see, that's what I'm wondering. Would I, he I just want to say I'm glad he didn't. I mean, would he have killed Ivanova? <laughs> Sorry. Right. No, I get it. But <laughs> I'm glad he didn't. But I, I also wonder if he would have or not. That is an interesting question. Because it would change the dynamic a lot. For one, we wouldn't get her in a couple different episodes. And uh, the the, story, the the dynamic of the story, again, because you're right, Marcus probably would have been back. So that's a whole different season five right there just with that character. But also, how do we how do we deal with Ivanova's death rather than her just leaving for a pay dispute? You're questioning whether he would have killed her if yeah. she did if he, he had known she was leaving prior to filming sleeping if, flight or even if prior to this filming of this episode if this episode yeah. was filmed and actually next week's episode and she had already said i'm not signing the contract what does he do does he continue with his plan except for making marcus survive or does he just off her and move on i don't know the, i don't know the answer to that but it's an interest it would be an interesting dynamic for the show either way mm-hmm 
Okay, and the last one, the good guys will take Mars next week, but probably not Earth yet. And Sheridan will fulfill his promise to free Mars. He's close. He's close. Uh, Mars really, I mean, aside from Mars being the staging area for the telepath uh, distribution, Mars is ancillary. They're, they're going to take Earth. The The end game is taking Earth. Once you take Earth, Mars is free. So yeah. don't worry about Mars. Just keep on going past yeah, it. We'll get there. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, but he's right on that. Sheridan will fulfill it. And that's part of the deal is... Uh, for Earth to join the Alliance and get the Mimbari tech, they have to not have colonies anymore. They have to free their colonies or give their colonies the ability to be free. So that's part of the deal. Yeah, it's weird how they never really talk about um, Orion 7 again after yeah. the events of Season 3. They talk about Proxima and they talk about Mars, but Orion 7 literally never gets mentioned again, at least in in the television show canon. I don't know. I, want, I don't know if it comes up in the books at all, but I wonder if it's a sheer just fact of numbers. Like, is Orion Seven like five thousand people on, on some kind of mining right. facility? Yeah. So that really doesn't fact. You guys can be free too. Enjoy starving. <laughs> I'm thinking like the uh, the prison planet on Alien Three. There's like twenty six oh, nice. guys yeah. hanging out there. It's space Florida. Like we have it, <laughs> but we don't really want to talk about it. <laughs> if you guys want to secede. We can deal. We'll be okay. Yeah. To all of our friends in Florida, you can send your hate mail. You get it. If you're still to, listening at this yeah. point. You <laughs> if you're our friends in Florida, you don't like Florida anyway. Yeah. Let's be honest yeah. here. <laughs> your car broke down there and you haven't been able to leave. God damn. <laughs> Got flooded by a hurricane. Yeah. Oh, boy. Okay. Anything else you guys want to add to the conversation before we close out? Please, no. Who else can we offend <laughs> or piss off? or we got time we still got a whole season guys uh but yeah I, I'm, I'm i'm gonna be interested to see how this impacts because in game and rising star are kind of a two-parter so i think we won't have the real full newbie conversation about all of this that happened after until rising star but i'm interested to see what their predictions are going to be for season five because season four kind of wraps most of this stuff up with a nice little bow that'll be a good conversation for our live show too to see what they think season I, five is going to be all about i predict that our predictions will be all over this for five i think you're right i think and i'm looking forward to it, especially when i you know i always reveal to them the name of the next season the next season name doesn't tell you shit it's wheel someone's, of fire <laughs> someone's gonna someone's gonna say the shadows are back uh someone's gonna say bureau 13 is back it's Who really knows? gonna be about lita boning a telepath for seven episodes it's gonna be great <laughs> It's going to be awesome. Fantastic. On that note, uh, we'll be back here next week to discuss Endgame. I've been Scott, and with me has been... Blake. Kevin. And Mike. And remember to like, subscribe, follow, join us on our social medias, all listed down below. And if you want to send some hate mail our way, feel free to do that as well. Be sure if you're on YouTube, click that like, subscribe, and notify button. We will be live for our end of season four wrap up here very, very soon. So click that notify button so you can join in, in the conversation live. And we'll talk soon. See ya. RIP, Ivanova. RIP. Right, guys. I got to use the bathroom like super bad. So I will talk to you later. I, I, I don't like what I'm hearing here. I'm not a great liar. I'm a, I'm a terrible liar. You know, I don't know who's been saying these things, but I want you to know when we get back, I am going to sue somebody. I don't know who and I don't know how, but guys, by God, I am going to sue somebody. <laughs>